simple enough. Even I can figure that out. How's everybody doing tonight? Yeah. Amen. Here in just a little while, we'll be in the book of Haggai, that real easy book to find in the Old Testament that you read every day, no doubt. Amen. I have a sermon that I'm not going to preach called, Is God in Your Box? And you know, one of the things you're going to have to battle, and I talked about it the first night, is just listening to the Holy Spirit, doing what He says, and trusting Him. But we do box God in, in our lives and in our church, and we think He has to operate according to our parameters. And by the way, that's one of the reasons a lot of our churches don't ever see God do anything. They say, God, we want you to do something, but then we want you to do it within our time frame. Come on. <laughs> and do it the way we like it. Uh, my wife and I, I've got four children, and a few years ago, uh, quite a few years ago, I decided that we just needed a break. I mean a break. We need to get away from everybody and everything. And so we had a little pop-up camper, and we took it to an out-in-the-middle-of-nowhere place to pop it up and stay for about five days in Kentucky. And, uh, well, Wednesday night rolled around, and we thought, you know, we need to go to church. And so we started driving around looking for a church, and um, I don't know how most preachers are, but I think you're probably like me. We can tell by looking at church whether it's a good one or a bad one. <laughs> We're a mess, aren't we? I drive by a church and say, ah, that's a liberal church. I ain't going there. Drive by another church and say, ah, I can tell that ain't no good church. You know, you get to thinking, you know what? It, well, sure enough, we went by this one church, and I told my wife, I said, that's the church I want to go to. That's an all-black church. And I said, that's where I want to go to church tonight. So we did. Well, I, I thought I knew what time it started. And when we got there, I walked in, and the preacher's up there preaching. And uh, you, you know some of the Pentecostal stereotypical. This was a Baptist church. But you know some of the stereotypical black preachers in those churches he had on a purple suit. He had on a purple shirt. He had on a purple tie. He had gold everywhere. And he was up there talking about wine in the Bible. And about 15 minutes into that thing, I'd never been there in my life, me and my wife sitting on the very back pew. And about 15 minutes into that thing, he, they started asking him questions. And he just had no clue. He was sweating bullets. I kid you not, he was miserable. And out of the middle of nothing and nowhere, he looked back at me and he said, Hey, brother, you look like a preacher. I said, Yes, sir. He said, You got any help for my people? I said, Yes, sir. He said, Come up here and help us. He sat down, I got up and preached and taught for about 30 minutes from Matthew 26 and Isaiah 65 and Genesis chapter 49 and uh, John chapter 2 about the blood and how the wine is a type of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and what Mary was talking about when, you know, she asked for the new wine and I started teaching on them. Man, all them people started getting happy. That's right, amen, yeah, that's good. Well, I'm telling you, I like preaching in those churches. A whole lot better than these dead Baptist churches. Yeah. I'm running for life after preaching in a few of those churches. I mean, everything else is dead after that. And so I got through talking about wine and the blood and the grape juice and how Adam didn't eat an apple. Amen. It was not an apple. And I went back and sat down. Man, he got up and said, Lousy me! He said, Preacher, you got any more? I said, Yes, sir. He said, Then come up here and give us some more. So I got up there and gave them some more. And I talked for about 15, 20 more minutes, gave them a testimony and talked about what God done in my life. I got through and he said, oh, my brother. I sat back there with my wife, got through and sat down. He said, brother, I want you to come back up here. It's the third time. He got me back up. He said, now, y'all, I want you to just kneel right there. He said, get your family up here. Is that your family back there? I said, yes, sir. He said, get them up here. I reluctantly told my wife and kids, come on. I didn't know what was coming. I had no idea what was going to happen next. And we got up there, and he said, I want you to kneel right here and put your arms around your family. And I did, and he said, now, church, all y'all gather around. Let's thank God for the blessing he sent our way today. <laughs> you couldn't do that in an independent King James fundamental Bible-believing Baptist church. Your life depended on it. It ain't in the bulletin. 
It ain't in the program. If we'd just learn to let God have His way and speak to our hearts and just yield to the Holy Spirit, it'd be a sight what God could do. But we put Him in a box, and that's the uh, intro to the sermon I'll preach one of these days on is God in your box, Lord willing. But tonight, I want you to turn to Haggai. Let me do just a real quick review. Sunday night I talked about priming God's pump, which means if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. It means as you learn to give generously, then you see God move generously in your life. The more you learn to be a blessing, the more blessings you'll get. It is a be- The greatest blessing is being a blessing. Quit asking God to bless you and ask Him to make you a blessing. God, I want to be a blessing to somebody because God, you've already blessed me more than I deserve. And as you learn to be a blessing, God will pour out blessings. It is more blessed to give. You think playing golf's a blessing? Then you like to go play golf a lot. You think fishing's a blessing? You like to fish a lot. You think giving's a blessing? (laughs) It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. So we talked about God adding fruit to your account. You're investing in eternity and so on. Then... Uh, Monday night, uh, last night, I talked about why you won't prime God's pump. When you learn to give, you prime God's pump. But God does say, prove me, put me to the test. That's what He wants you to do. But the reason you won't is because of too many options. We are, sl- the title of that message, I called it last night, sla- uh, too many options. I originally called it Slaves to Society. We are the consumed, if you will. And people think what I preached last night is just fluff. It's just stuff that's not important, but it occupies your mind and your heart. I can prove that most of you, like most people in America, have problems with these things by just simply asking you, how much power do you have in your prayer life? Or by asking you, did you have family devotions every night last week? You do have family devotions at your house, don't you? I mean, men, you do pray with your wife. Take her by the hand. Pray with her every day, don't you? I mean, you get on Craigslist every day. You check your email every day. You text every day. Surely you pray with your wife every day. Well, it's quiet again. I ain't even started preaching yet. I'm telling you, all this technology and sports and stuff has gotten us so occupied, we don't even obey the simplest biblical commands, which is for fathers and sons and families to pray together, for men to have family devotions and lead their children in spiritual things. But all this stuff is robbing us of the real blessings of life. And that's not not an exaggeration. When's the last time you wept over a lost soul? I'm talking about what this stuff is doing to us. Solomon had it all. He said it was vanity and vexation of spirit. The reason I'm so hard on all this technology and sports and all this stuff is it leads to a lot of problems. It leads to addictions. It leads to a lot of wasted time. It leads to poor health and it leads to poor stewardship. But the biggest problem I have with the internet and with television and technology is it destroys relationships. When I was growing up, I used to hear people say a lot, well, my daddy always said. I don't ever hear that anymore. Because daddies don't take their little boys down to the creek bank and spend a couple hours with them. They're sitting in front of the television. Daddies don't take them camping. Daddies don't take them on hikes. They're all sitting in front of a living room in front of their God. It destroys relationships. Number two, it desensitizes the spirit. We're numb to spiritual things. I want to preach a message tonight. If I was trying to impress you, I wouldn't preach the message I'm going to preach tonight. But I'm not trying to impress anybody. I'm trying to help you. And you know what's happening in our churches? And and Baptists are getting bad about this. Preachers are using theatrics to hold a crowd. I'm not here to entertain you. If I happen to tell a funny story or if I happen to say something you enjoy, I praise the Lord for that. But my job is to preach and teach the Word of God. 
And we are desensitized now, and so we go to church, and if we don't get made to laugh or feel good or happy or joyful, we'll go find somewhere else and let them sing rock music to us so we can say we had a good time. I don't know about what this stuff is doing to us. It destroys relationships, it desensitizes us, and it develops strongholds in our lives. So tonight I'm going to preach a very basic, simple message called Finances 101. I want to give my disclaimer before I preach it. Number one, I do not believe it is a sin to have debt. I know about the preachers that preach that. I think you ought to try to be debt free. I think if you can get debt free, that's a wonderful thing. But it is not a sin to have debt. You cannot prove that with the Bible and don't quote to me, oh, no man, anything. What that's talking about is loving people. It'd be good for you to not have debt. But don't you, don't you put somebody in bondage. It'd be real good for you to have no credit card debt. That probably is a sin. I don't preach against credit cards. These are my disclaimers. I've got a credit card. Right now, my credit card company owes me over $500. You pay your bills. I've got a Discover card, and as long as I pay the bill every month, I earn points, and I can, I can call them in tomorrow and tell them, send me a check, $500-something. It pays me. So it, my, my credit card makes me money. So I don't teach that it's a sin to have a credit card, but if you can't pay it at the end of the month, you need to get rid of it. Amen. Everybody okay? Amen. I do not teach it's a sin to have debt. I can't believe you can prove that biblically. I don't believe it's wrong for women to have a job outside the home. These are my disclaimers. I'm a Bible believer. You want to talk Bible with me? See me after church. I'll be glad to talk about it. And let me say this, I'm well aware of the fact that I am in Dayton, Ohio. I know where I'm at when I preach tonight. These are my disclaimers, okay? And so take your Bible and turn to Haggai chapter 1. Let's all stand as we honor the reading of the Word of God. I'm going to be a little bit more meticulous with my notes tonight. This is going to be a very, uh, uh, probably a very painful, meticulous, boring sermon. Because I'm going to talk about money. And... Um, and it's stuff you just, it, it is so elementary. But Americans need it desperately. Now the Bible says in Haggai chapter 1 verse 5, Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. <laughs> Does anybody, can you identify? But you see, the problem is not a lack of money. You're putting it in the wrong bag. Amen. Everybody that's ever come to me for financial counseling, when I get through talking to them, I simply have to look at them and say, well, you were wrong. You've got enough income. It's your outgo that's killing you. He said in verse 5, consider your ways, and then talks about what they're doing with their wages, and says in verse 7, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Ways. I want to ask you tonight to just consider your ways with your finances. Let's pray. Father, I beg and plead in the name of the Lord Jesus that you give every person in this place tonight the wisdom to see the wealth of wisdom in this book concerning finances and help them, Lord. Help your people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Now, this message is especially, well, it's for everybody, but hey, if you're here under 30, you need to get a hold of what I'm going to talk about tonight. I can really, now, I'm not going to draw. I can't draw a stick man. <laughs> I can't draw anything, but I'm going to put a few things. Sometimes it's just good for you to see it. So we're going to talk about considering your ways, and I hope especially young people, even if you're 14, get a hold of this. Young men come to me and say, Brother Ron, I want to know about uh, how to prepare for marriage. I say, okay, let's talk about your savings account. How much you got in it? Yeah. You want to get married? 
going to take some money. Especially if you're going to marry a spoiled girl. <laughs> so this will help you young people if you'll get a hold of it. Let me ask you a question. Are your finances a testimony of faith? Do you run your house God's way or the American way? Take your Bible and turn. You've seen the passage. By the way, you know the context of Haggai, don't you? He's preaching to them because they're getting ready to rebuild the temple and these people are putting all their money into their houses. And God sends a preacher to tell them, hey, you're spending an awful lot of money on your house. How about the work of God? That's what Haggai's about. Now let's go and show you some Bible. 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Some of the most basic, simple truths tonight. I hope y'all are a Bible-believing church. I believe, I believe that's what I was told. Y'all believe the King James Bible, right? Okay, that'll really help me if you do. I, I might find out if you do. I've got a sermon series called Verses Nobody Will Preach. Now, I know that's a stretch, but boy, there's a bunch of them out there that very few people... I guarantee Joel Osteen won't preach them. <laughs> First Timothy chapter 5, verse 14, Paul the Apostle says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, <laughs> guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. I'm asking you, do you run your house God's way or the American way? And I'm reading a verse that says the younger women are supposed to marry, bear children, and guide the house. <laughs> that sounds like some of them old-fashioned chauvinistic pigs, doesn't it? I had a lady say to me one time, you just believe every woman ought to be barefoot and pregnant. I said, no, I don't. I think she ought to wear shoes every now and then. That didn't go over too well. Turn to Titus chapter 2, and I was only kidding when I told her that. <laughs> Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, look at verse 3. Let me, write a, let me write a word real quick up here. Titus chapter 2, verse 3. I know some of you will not be able to see this from where you're at, but that's okay. What's that word? Admonish. Do we have an eraser? I probably won't need it. It's okay. Let me write it a little bit different. What does this word mean? What does admonish mean? To exhort or to warn. Look it up. It means a warning. What's the root word? It's the same root word for money. It literally is. Almost every passage in the Bible about money is a warning. It really is. Have y'all ever been going down the road and a car comes at you blinking their lights, flashing their headlights? What are they doing? They're warning you. You're glad, aren't you? Or do you turn around and chase them down and say, What are you doing flashing your lights at me? I'll speed if I want to. No, you're glad they warned you, aren't you? But a preacher gets up and warns you, and you get mad at him. Almost every passage in the Bible about money, which is a warning, is a warning. Money is the root. The root word for money is the same as the root word for admonish. Now, I want you to look at this. Titus chapter 2, verse 3. Titus chapter 2, verse 3. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not giving them much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women. I find this so interesting that the older women in the church are to teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands. Now doesn't that seem like an odd thing to have to teach? But young women don't know how to love biblically. It has to be taught. Notice it also says to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste. Uh-oh. Keepers at home. Is that what it says? Now don't, 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 don't stiffen up on me. It says, just like it said in that past, that other passage, they're to bow, bear the children, guide the house. Here it says they're to be keepers at home, Obedient, by the way, and I'm not going to preach on this because it would make everybody uncomfortable, and I'm not there here to do that. I'm not like Vance Abner. He said his ministry was to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. 
But it does say that they're to be obedient to their own husbands. Not somebody else. I'm not going to tell you what happened after World War II when all the women started going out into the workforce and what happened to the divorce rate. I'm not going to preach on that because Proverbs 31 does teach that a woman can have an income and she can go out and make money. That's biblical. I have no problem with that. But if a woman has children, her primary job is to take care of those children. Amen. It's not the government's job. All these government politicians and everybody say, what are you going to do about single moms and college education? It's not the government's job. And, and, and we are already sucked into that thing to where now we think it's the government's job to take care of everybody. It's not the government's job. Now, maybe you're asking yourself by this point, 1 Timothy 5 and Titus chapter 2, what in the world does that have to do with faith? Well, listen, I, I'm just going to be honest with you. How many of you believe... Who is supposed to be the provider in the home? How many of you believe it's the husband and father that's supposed to be the provider? Is he supposed to provide food and clothes and shelter? Is it his job to pay the electric bill? Is it his job to pay the water bill? Is it his job to take care of, of the needs of the home? Everybody agree? So then if a woman works, she can give all her money to missions. You just set yourself up. What's she working for? I didn't say it was wrong. And I didn't say she shouldn't. I just said, don't, you can't do one thing to the neglect of the will of God. That's all I'm teaching. If, it, if you have children, you're to take care of those children. Oh, now we've got women whose husbands have abandoned them. We've got single women who have four or five kids. And I understand their position is unique. I would not dare put them down for doing what they've got to do to take care of their family. I'm simply saying it looks like to me that we as Bible believers agree that if a man's job is to provide, take care of the bills, put groceries in the cabinet, put clothes on the back, put a roof over your head... What's the woman supposed to do with her money? Man, it's quiet in here. Is it a legitimate question? I, I'm asking you to... Cons what am I asking you to do? Consider your ways. If he's the breadwinner and he's to take care of all those things, then, hey, I, I did this in my church years and years and years ago, and a man came up to me after I preached this message. You see, here's what I teach these young couples... If you're going to go out and get a job and you're going to have children at home, at least think about it. At least consider what you're doing. Don't just do it blindly. Don't just blindly say, well, it takes two incomes to get by this day and time. It does not. It takes two incomes to get by on the level you're wanting to live at. And so I tell these young couples, at least consider your ways and stop and think about the fact that if she's going to have to work, then she's going to have to have a good vehicle to get her to work, and she's going to have to have good tires because you don't want her having a wreck, and she's going to have to have that vehicle maintained, and she's going to have to have the clothes that she needs to go and work in that place, and she's going to to, she's gonna have to eat out more because you and her are not going to feel like cooking when you both get home and you're both wore out, and somebody's going to have to take care of those kids, and it's probably going to move you into a different tax bracket, and by the time you figure out all the costs for her to go to work, she might might not be making that much. And a very, very stable, influential man in my church came up to me and he said, my wife worked for three years and we figured out by the time we looked at all the costs that, that it added to our lifestyles for her to work, she was making about $2,000 a year. Now, don't get mad. I'm asking you to consider your ways. I believe God will help you tonight if you want help. And I'd say there's probably some people in here that you stay frustrated with your finances. And the problem in American homes is really quite simple. It's a lack of discipline, a lack of discretion, and a lack of desire to honor God with your money. I have couples come to me. I had a couple come to me years ago. They were in my church, and they said, we're going to file for bankruptcy. Now, that we'd already helped them about three times with their finances. And they said, we're going to file for bankruptcy. I said, why? They said, because... There's no way that we can get this problem taken care of. I had a neighbor, he's in heaven now, and he was in his 80s. And I brought this up to him one time. I said, boy, we see these young couples. I was trying to get him to, I was baiting him. I wanted to hear what he had to say. 
I said, we see these young couples now, they get married and they both got jobs and they hadn't been married a year and they got a house worth $250,000 and they're driving vehicles worth $35,000 and $40,000 and they got credit cards maxed out. And what do you think about that, brother? He said, I'll tell you what my daddy always told me. He said, my daddy always told me if your outgo was more than your income, your upkeep would be your downfall. If your out goes more than your income, your upkeep will be your downfall. That's wisdom. That's Bible. And so what the problem is, I looked at that young couple. I said, okay, I want to get some numbers from you. They sat down in front of me, and I asked them how much they spent on this, this, and this. And I was writing the numbers down in my lap so they couldn't see it. They were spending $180 a month on cigarettes. Do not fuss about your level of living. If you're spending that much money on cigarettes, you shouldn't be spending a penny on them, by the way. Yeah. Well, let me throw this in and make everybody happy, but don't you be fussing at the guy smoking while you're drinking your three Mountain Dews a day. It's a missions conference, ain't it? Isn't this an exciting time? I tell preach, I get preachers get mad at me. I'll preach where there's a bunch of preachers, and I get off on this stuff. I'm sick and tired of you preaching against alcohol and preaching against smoking and preaching against this and preach, and, and you 75 pounds overweight and drinking three Mountain Dews a day. Well, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. So us guilty preachers, and we're all guilty, we preach against all of it. I'm going to preach against my sin just as much as I will anybody else's sin. But I'm telling you this, you ought to consider how much money that stuff's costing you. Not only what it does to your health. I've got a sister that is in terrible, terrible health, and another sister invited me to eat breakfast at their house. This sister showed up and drank three Mountain Dews for breakfast. I've got to get off that subject. That's what got me in trouble last night. <laughs> I mean, we go to youth camp, and we've got grown adults at 7 o'clock in the morning. I've got to have my caffeine. Where's the, cat? Where's the Cokes? Where's the Mountain Dews? <laughs> we don't have them. Let's send them home. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Loosen up a little bit. Some of you are so guilty you can't enjoy church. Let's get back to the subject. I'm going to try my best to stay on cue tonight. What I'm asking you to do is consider your ways and the problem with most people's finances is a lack of discipline, a lack of discretion, bad decisions, and a lack of desire to honor the Lord. Let me ask you a few questions. If I get up to preach and I want God to supernaturally work while I preach, is there anything I'm required to do? I better study and pray and prepare. And, amen? Let me ask you this question. Uh, if you raise your children and you want to raise them for the glory of God and you want God to get in on it, does He expect you to do anything? Yeah. So if you want God to supernaturally bless your preacher, you expect Him to do some things Monday through Saturday, don't you? If you want God to supernaturally bless your children, then you've got to do your part. Would you like for God to supernaturally bless your finances? He's, he does it all through the Bible. All through the Bible, God gets in on it. Do we want God's blessings on our finances? And the question is, do we really trust God's plan? We know that He's the owner and we're the stewards, but do we really trust God's plan? Do we believe He knows better how to manage our money than we do? So the first night I took you to Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, Proverbs 11, 24, and 25, Philippians 4, 18, and 19, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 6 to 8, 1 Timothy 6, 17, and 19, Luke chapter 6, verse 38, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, to show you that what God teaches is that as you are generous with your giving and you try to be a blessing to others, God adds fruit to your account, pours out the blessings of heaven on you, and multiplies the seed sown. But do we trust God to call the shots with our finances? A lot of people really do believe they can do better with their own plan. I've watched God bless some of the businessmen in my church who've come to me. They tithe their business income. And I've seen God take some of those little old bitty businesses that started out 5, 10, 15 years ago, and now they've got 6, 7, 8 employees 
and, and those employees are saved people and they're given to God and God blesses that business. And then I see these businessmen that are so stingy they won't even pay a good man a good salary. And they wonder why they can't keep help. So I go to the Bible and preach on how an employer ought to take care of his employees. Pay him more than he's worth. Amen. Stinginess just doesn't pay. God doesn't like stinginess. God likes generosity. Liberality is what God calls it. Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 25. I'm telling you, one of the reasons so many people struggle is they're too stingy. We saw that in Proverbs chapter 11 the other night. Look at Matthew chapter 25. Here's where we get started with finances 101. No more Mountain Dew comments, I promise. <laughs> at least tonight. Matthew 25, look at verse 14. I'm going to try to save some time with some of this. Now, I know this is tribulation, millennium. I understand all the rightly dividing. I'm with you. I'm, I'm all right with that. Doctrinally, hey, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And there are spiritual and devotional applications in these passages that we are missing and we've got to get a hold of them. The Bible says in Matthew 25, verse 14, For the kingdom of heaven is a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his what? Goods. What did he give them? Look at verse 18. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. So we're talking about money. Okay? So you know the story. He gave them all a certain amount of money, and some of them did real good with it, and some of them did okay with it, and some of them didn't do good at all. Right? Y'all know that story? Save me a lot of time if you already know the story. Okay, you already know the story? Then look down at verse 28. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that shall be given he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. He had that one talent. He didn't do anything with it. He didn't multiply it. He didn't invest it. He didn't use it. He just held on to it. And what did God do with it? Took it away from him. But that's not all. Here's the scary part. Verse 30. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What's the principle? This is the way he treated a fella that at the end of the journey at least had held on to what God gave him. If he treats him like that, what's he going to do to those that wasted what they were given? At least he held on to it. What if we just waste it? Just use it for selfish reasons. Now listen to me carefully. There's, there's a lot of ways to use your money and there's a lot of ways to invest your money and there's a lot of ways to be a blessing with your money. If you go to Proverbs 28, I'm not going to go there tonight. It's verse 22. It's a picture of the way Americans are. We want quick results. We, we want to make a lot of money real fast. That's not what God wants you to do normally. He wants you to work for a living. Generally speaking, God wants you to work for a living. It's a sad thing how many people are broke because of the lottery. They want to get rich quick. It's a sad, lot, sad story how many families have been destroyed by day trading. A man who's addicted, gambling on the Internet. Why? Got to have it now. That's not God's plan. That is not God's design. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with that. Here's our problem. We'll try to save up $500 and put it in the bank. I want to encourage you. Quit trying to save up $500 and just save five. I hope you'll bear with me until I get to the end of this thing. I'll make some sense of it. I promise if you'll bear with me, I'll make some sense out of this thing. Uh, I tell people all the time, and I tell young people this, uh, you need to quit worrying about trying to save up $500. Just be careful what you do with that $5 bill. Okay? Let's say, how many weeks in a year? All right, let's just say you're going to save $5 a week. Okay, $5 a week. Five times two is 10, 25, $260, right? $260 in a year. Is that right? So in 10 years, how much is that? 2600 in 20 years, how much is that? $5,200. Just saving $5 a week for 20 years gives you... That's no interest. 
Okay, well, let's take $10. Let's take 52 times 10. Well, all we got to do is go down here and double it, right? That's $10,400 just because you saved $10 a week for 20 years and then you got $10,400. Wow, let's go up to $20. 52 times $20 a week, and then you double this and you got $20,800 in 20 years just because you saved $20 a week. What does that mean? That means you quit eating out, and in 20 years when your little girl gets married, you can hand her $20,000 as a gift. Or you can just keep eating out. Which one do you want to do? How many times she get married and you, people say, I can't even afford the wedding. I bet you could afford to eat out three and four times a week. I'm asking you, what do you want to do with your $5 bill, your $10 bill, your $20 bill? It adds up, doesn't it? Over a period of 20 years, by the time your little girl's born and by the time she turns 20, without even using any interest, you've got over $20,000 just because you chose to give up a Big Mac every week. Uh, Y'all getting this? I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to show you some very fundamental, simple things that we... You know why we can do that? Because out of sight, out of mind. Do you know what? If the IRS were every week to make you give them the taxes that they take out of your check, there'd be a revolution in this country. But because you never handle it and it never goes through your hands and you turn around and hand it back, it doesn't even bother you till April 15th. And so you don't see that money, you just hand them that card. Very painless. But that's what it adds up to, folks. Young people, get a hold of this. Young people, you're 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 year old. Right now, start putting $10 a week aside. Don't let anybody touch it. And in over 20 years, look how much money you're going to have. You say, that won't be a lot of money in 20 years. That's what I'd have thought 20 years ago. I'd sure love to have 20000 right now. How many of you would like to have $20,000 handed to you right now? Oh, hallelujah. Don't tell me that's not a whole lot of money. And by the way, that's not even using interest. There's no telling what we'll do if you use it even better than that. Here's what I'm going to challenge you to do tonight. I've challenged everybody I've preached to in the last 15, 20 years to do this. I'm going to beg you to do this. Nobody will do it, but I'm going to beg you anyway. I'm going to plead with you to do it, but you won't do it. I guarantee you won't do it. I know you won't do it. I want you to take a 90-day test. And for the next 90 days, I want you to record every penny that you spend for 90 days. Because you have no idea how much you're spending on soft drinks. You have no idea how much you're spending on gum and candy. You don't know. You have no idea how much you're spending on a Mountain Dew or a Dr. Pepper. You have no idea when you went in there to pay for your gasoline and you weren't planning on buying that thing sitting off to the side. Boy, they can make those soft drinks look so good sitting in that big ice tank. You didn't really want one, didn't really need one, but boy, I hadn't had one of them in a long time. I believe that's the reason the receipt won't come out at the pump a lot of times. It's a scam. They know how to get you in that store. I'm asking you to record every penny. You and your wife, you and your kids, hold each other accountable. Don't cheat. Hey, if you're supposed to be a good steward, how can you be a good steward if you don't even know where your money's going and how much you're spending? Are you listening? 90 days. I asked every church to do this that I preach missions conference in. I went to church in Kentucky two years ago. I wrote it down. The next year, I came back and a man walked up to me. He said, Brother Ron, he said, you took us to that 90-day test last year. He said, I didn't make it. He said, I went 40 days and quit. I said, why? He said, because you told us to especially keep up with how much money we're spending at fast food restaurants. He said, in 40 days, I spent over $600. He said, I had no idea. And you say, I can't believe he did that. You don't know what you're doing. 10 here, 10 there, 15 here, 15 there, 20 here, 20 there. You have no idea. 90 days, record it. Take your Bible, turn to Psalm 105. Aren't you glad you came to church tonight? Oh, you're so excited now. You can't wait to get home and start recording. 
God says uh, you better take stock of your, of your livestock over there in Proverbs. If you're going to be a good farmer, you've got to know how many cattle you got. You got to, hey, he talked about it. He talked about it on these ships. I mean, they got to, they got to keep up with the records. They've got to know where the tools are. They've got to know where everything's at. They've got to know what they've got to use. They've got to know what they, they can use when they get out to sea and all that stuff. It's just a part of life. If you're going to be a good steward and you're supposed to be a good steward, you need to know what you're doing with your money. Look at Psalm 105 real quick. Psalm 105. Verse 16, Psalm 105, verse 16. Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. He broke the whole staff of bread. He sent a man before them, even who? Joseph. Joseph. You find out some things in Psalms you don't find out in Genesis. Here's what the Bible says. He sent out a man, verse 17, before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron. Watch it. Until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. You see that? The king sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. Watch this. He made him. That's Pharaoh made him, Joseph, Lord of his house, ruler over all, ruler of all of his substance. But the Bible says in verse 19, the word of the Lord tried him. Now, I want you to hold on to that thought. I want to sort of get something in your mind and heart. In our country, money has become a possession rather than a tool. It's something we own instead of something we use, if you will. I want to remind you that when I took you to 1 Timothy chapter 6, it talks about the rich being willing to distribute, ready to communicate, giving your money to be a blessing to others. And when I taught that, I said it's the same as in 2 Corinthians 8. The Bible says that church in Macedonia was given to those people who had need so that when their need came, God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, there'll be equality. What he teaches in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 is that right now God's given you a surplus. He's blessed you. You've got plenty. You live in the land of plenty. You've got more than you realize. And if if you'll be a blessing to those people going to the Philippines and other places, then one of these days, if your need comes, God will come to your rescue. Amen. That is the principle. So do you understand what God really teaches us? Is we ought to hate spending and we ought to love giving. But we love spending and hate giving. That's what you're supposed to do with your money. Now back to Joseph. The Bible says in verse 19, the word of the Lord tried him. So what I know is I study the Psalms and I study Genesis that Joseph was tried and tested and then God said he could be trusted over all the substance of the world empire called Egypt. You talk about moving on up. You talk about rising in the ranks. Why? Take your Bible, turn to the book of Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41, he was tried and tested, and God said he could be trusted. He was diligent, he was discerning, and he desired to honor the Lord. In Genesis chapter 41, look at verse 42. Genesis chapter 41, verse 42. The Bible says, Genesis chapter 41, verse 42, and Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck and he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had and they cried before him, bow the knee and he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that God just arbitrarily somewhere in the day of Joseph said, you know what, I need somebody I can put over the stuff in Egypt. I think I'll just pick, let's see here, hmm... Oh, Joseph. Mm, that's not the way God operates. God watched that young man. God saw something in this young man named Joseph. Look at chapter 37. Chapter 37. Joseph had the right attitude, and so God honored him and trusted him with wealth and authority. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 37, verse 2, these are the generations of Jacob, Joseph being 17 years old. You know the story. Look down at verse 12. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren free, feed the flock in Shechem. Come, I'll send thee unto them. And he said to them, Here am I. He said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren, well with thy flocks. Bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. He was faithful in the little things. He was faithful to take care of sheep. He was faithful to learn how to play a harp. He was faithful to take care of his brothers. He was faithful to obey his dad and God said, I like that young man. I think I'll advance him and put him in charge of all of Egypt. 
because he was faithful in the little things. Look at Genesis chapter 41 again. I'm going somewhere. Genesis chapter 41. So God put Joseph in charge, and the Bible says in Genesis chapter 41, verse 25. Genesis 41, verse 25. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God hath showed Pharaoh. Look at verse 28. Verse 28. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh, what God is about to do. Look at verse 32. And for that dream was, and for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God. Verse 39. Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this. Look at verse 52. Verse 52. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful. You know what Joseph did? He was met with a problem, a financial problem. And God gave him a financial plan. And it was God's plan, and he said it was God's plan. He didn't take credit for it. Now listen to me. Look at verse 34. I want you to see this. He, he's, he's put in charge of a lost man's wealth and gives God the credit for it. And the Bible says here in verse 34, I just thought I'd throw this in for what it's worth. Uh, let Pharaoh do this. Let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. You know, what, you know what Joseph's plan meant? That lost Egyptians were going to have to learn how to get by on 80% of their income. Am I right? That's the plan. For how long? Fourteen years, actually. Study it. God gave Joseph a plan for unsaved Gentiles for all of Egypt. And by the way, I think I'll throw this in. Evidently, God likes things done simply with percentages. What's a tithe? Ten percent. Any president that would run on the policy that I'm going to tax Americans 10% and there'll be no other taxes is going to get my attention. I'd love a 10% constitutional amendment, 10% tax rate. That's what everybody pays, no matter how poor, no matter how rich. Same for everybody and no other taxes. And then the government's got to learn to get by on that income. Yeah. Write my name in. You say, I don't like that idea. That's God's idea. Amen. God does things pretty simply. You don't have to have a thousand page IRS book. Ten percent. Nothing complicated about that. I'm just telling you God gave him a plan. Please listen to me about Joseph's plan. It was a divine plan. It was a definite plan. It had specifics in it. Let me ask you something. You young people come to me and say, would you help me get a budget? I say, okay, I'll help you with a budget. Let me ask you a question. How many weeks in a month? Well, if you do a budget that way, you're in trouble. Because in some months, there's four and a third weeks. I had a guy do a budget for me recently, and he did the budget, and I said, you're leaving something out here. I said, according to me, according to you, your income is this. And I said, according to my figures, your income is about $2,000 more than you're showing me. He said, where'd you come up with that? I said, not every month has four weeks. He looked at me like, do you reckon God's specific? I'm saying to you, I don't think we ever consider our ways. What you might want to do is budget yourself on about a 48-week plan and then take all that excess and give it to God. But you know what we do? We spend whatever we've got. Do we not? Our budget is, if I make it, I'm going to spend it. Why don't we learn to live on 70% of what we make? You say, you can't do that in America, Brother Ron. I got church members doing it. And they're happier than the church members that spend everything they make. Amen. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Listen, you're looking at a literal example. I've got more than I've ever had and give away more than I've ever given. It's a supernatural plan. You cannot explain it. I understand there's a little bit of truth. There's a lot of truth. There's a lot of truth in budgeting. There's a lot of truth. And you know what? You need to sit down and figure out, here's how much you make. Let's budget this and budget that. But once you get a hold of the mind of God and trust Him, I'm telling you, He does things that you can't put on paper. 
He, he brings in money you can't anticipate. He takes away bills you can't anticipate. Things show up that you never thought would show up. It's, I understand that you've got to do your math. I understand the percentages. I understand all of that. But I want you to get God involved supernaturally in your finances, at your church and at your house. And He'll expect you to be a good steward. But listen to me. It's a divine plan. It's a definite plan. Let me say this. It's a drawn-out plan. God gave Him a plan. It's a 14-year plan. Some of you haven't got a plan passed tomorrow. You got a bunch of debt? Get a plan. You got financial struggles? Get you a plan. It was a drawn out plan. I got a treasure. He's in heaven now. He died when he was 82, I believe. And this treasure, he helped my church a lot with finances. He was my treasure for 20 years. He was a retired lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. And he was, a, he was in charge of, of uh, I forget the words. But man, he was, a, he was an organizer to the nth degree, and he was our treasurer. It took him about 35 hours a week to do the treasurer's job at our church. And he just was, a, he was meticulous. By the way, missionaries would send me a letter and say, your church is the only church that gets the check to us at the same time every month. Missionaries appreciate that. How many of you would like for you to show up to get your check the next time you show up? And they go, ah, we'll have it Monday. Ah, we've sort of got some paperwork problems. We'll get it to you in a couple of days. Well, how do you think the missionary likes that? And so my treasure, I'd have him work with young couples. Brother, Brother Molitor knows him. He knew this guy. And uh, he, he taught us this. He said, you know, when I was young, he said, I bought a car. And he said, I got it paid for. He said, when I got it paid for, I kept making payments to myself. He said, even though it was paid for, I kept... Now, what do you do when you get yours paid for? What do you do with that money? Oh, you can go buy something else now, can't you? So he said, I kept making those payments. And he said, eventually, I had the money to go out and buy a new car. And so he said, for the last 40 years, every time I buy a car, I pay cash for it. He said, if they got a 0% interest, he said, sometimes I'll let them do it and I'll just make payments so that I can keep my money in the bank and let it make money while they let me have this car at no interest free. I mean, let's just face it. You got four hundred dollars a month payment, okay? That's forty-eight hundred dollars in a year, isn't it? So after you get through making that car payment, you hold on to that car. Oh, you got to have a new one. No, you don't. No, you don't. It'll stink as bad as the one you got in a few months. It'll have dents and scratches on it. It'll be. It'll be. It'll be the same. That's nothing wrong with buying a new truck. Nothing wrong with buying a new car. I'm not saying that's wrong. But just keep making those payments, and then you know, after about three years, maybe three years, would that be about fourteen thousand four hundred dollars? Then go buy you a vehicle that costs that much. You can buy a lot of vehicle for fourteen thousand dollars, and then keep making your payments. Maybe in about three or four years, you'll have twenty thousand dollars until you can pay cash. Wouldn't it be a blessing not to have to borrow money to buy a car? Wouldn't that be a blessing? That's what he did. But what we do is usually we don't even get it paid for before we trade it in. We just keep getting upside down and wrong side out and everything in the world, don't we? I told you this wasn't an exciting sermon. I, I'm not here to entertain you. I'm here to tell you Americans are in a mess financially. And they will not consider their ways. He had a divine plan, a definite plan, a drawn-out plan, and it was a disciplined plan. I'm not going to take a lot of time to talk about the discipline right now. Take your Bible and turn back to Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2. Oh, my. I'm going to do Brother Elliot dirty tonight. I'm not giving an invitation. When I get through, I'm just going to turn it over to him and let him say whatever he wants to say. Because I don't give an invitation when I preach a sermon. Almost always I say, all right, there's the facts. Now, what are you going to do with them? Go on and pray about it. Every inv best invitation happens when you get home. It really does. Go home and talk about it. Go home and get a plan. Go home and work on this thing. Now, I'm not through. Turn to Habakkuk, uh, Haggai, Haggai chapter 2. Do we, did, I think we talked about this last night. Do we say everything belongs to God? Everything belongs to God? The Bible says in uh, Psalm 24, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Look at Haggai chapter 2 verse 6. Haggai chapter 2, verse 6. Uh, 
For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will what? Shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desires of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord. Now I want you to notice, God said, I'm going to shake things up in verse 6 and 7. Now look at verse 8. The silver is mine and the gold is mine. Can I tell you, God might be about ready to shake some things up in this world. How's He going to do it? He owns the stock market. He shook things up in Greece pretty bad, didn't He? It's fixing to happen in Europe all over the place. And America's not far behind. Because we keep writing fake money. And God says, I own it all, and I'm fixing to shake things up. Let me ask you something. When, you sh- when God gets through shaking things up, where are we going to stand? I want to have a financial plan that trusts Him. I don't want to have to trust the bank. I want to trust God's plan. And know that I've done right when things were going well, so that when things are not going well, God's going to take care of me. He's the owner, is he not? Aren't we the stewards? Let me ask you a question. Does a steward manage resources according to his own will or the will of the owner? A steward is supposed to manage his resources according to the will of the owner. Let me ask you this question. Does a steward make decisions that benefit him personally or the owner? It's supposed to benefit the owner. But when the steward uses the resources to benefit the owner, does that owner not normally reward the steward and give him more resources to manage? Do you see the simple principle at this church, Anchor Baptist Church? If you'll give your resources to God, he'll multiply those resources and give you more to give him. It's just the way God set this thing up, but we don't trust God. We trust our own ability. And remember, the motive has to be right. I do not give in order to get. Rather, I strive to honor the Lord. And if my resources increase, then I'll honor Him with the increase. And it just keeps going. Let me ask you something. Who knows the future? The owner. The one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and owns everything on this planet, he's the one that knows the future. Wouldn't it be better for me to put my faith in the one that knows what's coming this year than to put it in myself when I don't know what's coming? And say, God, you call the shots. You know what's best. Take your Bible, turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Are we having fun yet? John chapter 6. Believe it or not, I'm almost through. Of course, almost is a vague term. John 6, verse 9. Oh, I'd like to see some young couples get a hold of this. There is a lad here, John 6, 9, which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sit down. In number about 5,000, Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks. Isn't that a blessing? By the way, I'm going to just say this. It might help you. It might not. It might make you mad. It says when he had given thanks. People say, Brother Ron, would you bless the food? And I say, no, but I'll sure thank God for it. I can't bless it. But I can be thankful for it. Y'all get this? A lot of people don't eat with a thankful heart. Jesus Christ gave thanks, distributed. Look at verse 11. He distributed it to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down. Jesus took the blessings, gave it to a handful, and let them distribute it to others. And likewise of the fishes, as much as they would, when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. My soul, the one who can feed 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes, said, let's not be wasteful. Isn't that amazing? The one who can take five loaves, two fishes, and multiply it. He could do that any time he wanted to, surely. Even though he could do that, he said, let's not be wasteful. Can I ask you something? Who do you reckon got those leftovers? I'll bet you there's a little boy running back to the house saying, Mama! 
Mama, you ain't gonna believe what Jesus did with that lunch you gave me. Mama, I gave it to him and look what he gave me back. That's my guess. <laughs> I can't believe you can find anything better than that. I wonder if we've not allowed the prosperity gospel and the name it, claim it crowd and the psycho babble crowd rob us of this biblical teaching that if we're gracious in our giving, God will bless us for it. I understand the motive is crucial. Let me ask you this. Jesus just assumes that he can ask that boy for his lunch. What gave him the right to do that? Jesus just, I don't even know if he asked it. He just took it. One time he told Peter, I need to use your boat. And just took his boat. One time he told the disciples, he said, go downtown there and there'll be a donkey tied up. Get it and bring it here. I need it. Didn't he? What makes him think he can do that? I preach a sermon called, Who Does God Think He Is? I know the answer. He thinks he's God. He said over there in Isaiah, I went through all of heaven and searched and couldn't find any other God. He said, I'm the only one. Amen. That's who God thinks he is. He owns it all. My time, my talents, my treasures, it's all his. Everything I have. But listen, if God is going to work supernaturally in our finances, we've got to do our part. Now some people say that, and this is going to sound odd to you, they say that some people think too much about money or think too much of money. And, and that's true, because some people define themselves by their money. They define themselves by what they drive, and they think because they've got a fancier car or more money, that makes them special. And that's not true. But uh, I'm going to say something sounds odd. I think a lot of people think too little of money. Turn to Luke 16. Luke 16. I think some people think too little of money. Did the Bible not say, consider your ways? Luke 16, verse 8. Luke 16, verse 8. And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely for the children of this world or in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is what? Least. Is faithful also in much. He says in verse 11, If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Almost sounds like if you'll be faithful with the quarters, God will let you send a missionary to China. What are the true riches? It's not money. But you've got to be faithful with the nickels and the dimes and the quarters. God has allowed our church to send missionaries out of our church. We now have ten full-time ministries out of our church. Missionaries, pastors, music leaders. Men have started churches. But it started in 1991 when some people decided to be faithful with their nickels and dimes and quarters and dollar bills. God cares about that loose change. We'll throw a $5 bill around like it's nothing. But it adds up, doesn't it? Folks, did He not say, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much? I'll close with Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24. I'm going to give you a strange verse. I mean, this verse, I've asked a bunch of preachers about this verse. We think we read verses and know what they mean, and then somebody puts us on the spot and we don't have a clue. Preachers, I'm, I'm as bad as anybody. Just read over it not even think about it. And then somebody points it out, and I'm like, man, I didn't even see that. Proverbs 24, verse 27. Proverbs 24, verse 27. Prepare thy work without, and make it fit for thyself in the field. And afterwards, build thine house. <laughs> you ever studied and meditated on that verse? So what does it mean? I don't know. 
I know it means this. You ought to have a job before you go buy a truck. I know it means this. You ought to have an income before you start building a house. But I just want to look at that first word. What does it say? Prepare. You know what that word means? Pre means first. Pair means getting rid of the call. You ever pared apples? Cut the peelings off? Are you listening to me? There's something we've got to do before we can really start to build. And it's to get rid of all those superficial, wasteful things in our lives so we can do something bigger and better. Study that passage. So tonight I'm asking you to take a 90-day test. You need to prepare. You need to record. You need to plan. Now why do I do that? Why would I dare you to do that? At least two things are going to happen, probably. Number one, it's going to make you aware. It's going to shock you how much you're spending on certain things that you had no idea. It's going to shock you. But the second blessing is you're going to quit buying certain things just because you're too lazy to write it down. You'll go to pay for that gas and you'll start to get, I ain't going to buy that. I've got to get that little book out and write it down. <laughs> You'd be surprised, folks, at the young people, young couples that have come to me with financial problems, not just in this church. I had a pastor in Kentucky ask me to help him with his finances. He had consolidated some loans and was paying 42% interest. And I said, I want you to record everything you're spending if you want me to help you for 30 days. And he never did it. He couldn't go 30 days. He couldn't do it. He's not disciplined enough. The problem with Americans are a lack of discipline, not a lack of money. And so I didn't just excite you and thrill you tonight. I gave you finances 101. Let the Lord use it. Let him help you with it. Amen? Brother Elliot, it's all yours. That. <laughs> Amen. I believe you always, always should make a commitment. So, uh, church, I'm going to do that right now with you. Uh, my wife will be having been praying like we should together. Uh, we get up, our days get real busy, and we just go off to the side. So from here out, me and her are going to get up in the morning, and we're going to start praying together. I said, number two, that was a wise decision right there. Uh, my wife's been always on my back. Uh, we need to have a budget. We, ha we haven't got a budget. Uh, I put every dime I can in this church, and I'm sitting there saying, Lord, did I do right? Did I do right? Did I do right? I'm going to, for the next 90 days, I'm going to make her <laughs> watch every dime I spend. <laughs> that way I don't have to worry about it. Now, men, I'm telling you, in your families, you're responsible for every dime that comes in that family and goes out. Whether your wife makes it or you make it, you're responsible for that dime. So you need to know where it's coming. Now, I, I would love to give $100,000 in missions. I just don't know where it's going to come from. However, comma, God knows. He does own the cattle of a thousand hills. I know he owns it. It's his. What I have is his, everything. My kids are not mine. They never were mine. They're his. Uh, my wife is not mine, they're his. I, I, there's a verse in the Bible where uh, he sat there and he said, uh, you're, you're a servant, you came in with nothing, and you can go out with nothing. Uh, he gave me a wife, he said, but the woman stays, the kids stay, because they're his. Okay, that's fine. I went up to the doorpost and stuck my ear on and said, hey, drive a nail right through there, man. I'm yours, I'm yours, I'm done. That's good preaching, that's real good preaching. Uh, you want to do something for God? Then you need to do something for yourself. And God gives you the ability, so... For 90 days, I'm going to ask you to make a commitment and do the exact same thing. Husbands, if you're not praying with your wives, I just admit it to you. I'm not going to ask you to come up here and admit to that. I'm just admitting to you. I have prayed my, You know how many times that woman's asked me to do that? Oh, I, just, I got to go take care of something at the church, and I got to go do this, and I got to go do this. And I didn't. And, I mean, he smacked me all over the place just then. That's the most precious thing he's ever given me is that lady right there. And he says, take care of her. Am I taking care of her? Financially, am I taking care of her? And then he says, I've got a job. I want to give you more. That captain on the ship, all the men that I ever worked for on a ship, it took me about two or three months for them to trust me. I, I one time on a ship, uh, Sea Chief uh, Franklin, one of the greatest men I ever worked for in my life, uh, I took a stack of uh, chits about this high 
And when I say a chip, they're eight pieces of paper put together. And when you order something, you got this number about this long. And if you want to order a pencil, you have a number this long, you put down and say, I need a pencil. Then you put how many you want in there. And then, so me and Senior, he trusted me like anything, man. So I had to stack them this big. And I walk into his office, I say, hey, Senior, I need to get you to sign some chips. He says, oh, Mike, sit down, let's talk for a while. So I did. So he starts signing while we're talking. And he hands them back to me, and I'm starting making it in two stacks. And when I get done, I have a stack about this high, and I have a stack about this high. And I said, Senior, you know what you just did? I said, you just bought me a new car. I said, you just bought me this. You just bought everybody new boots and shoes and everything else. I said, don't you ever watch what you're signing? He goes, no, Elliot, I trust you. He said, I don't have to watch it. That's what you do. He told me one time, he said, if I have to go up to radio where you work, he said, you better be dead. I, knew, I laughed when I walked up. I knew what he meant. You know what he meant? He said, if, if I come up there to talk to you, I'll come up and talk to you in fellowship. But I better never have to walk in there to do anything. He said, that's your responsibility. That man never, ever, ever, ever had to walk in any one of my spaces and do anything except talk to us and fellowship with us. I'm standing on the side of a ship one day, line two. We, we were the ones who actually tied the ship up. We had line one, two, three, four, five down the side of the ship. And I had a crew, and we stood on the side of the ship. And the line was sitting there. And when we pulled up, you threw the line over, and they hooked it on the ballard on the, on the pier. And then you tied it all up, and you got the, the slack out of it, and you moored. And uh, I'm standing out there, and they put us way out in the middle of the ocean. They put us way, way out there. And you can't even see land yet. And we're all standing at parade rest in whites, and we're freezing to death. I mean, it's sleeting and snowing, and we're all out there, and everybody's starting to mumble and grumble. And I, I was about ready to go right with them. I was right there. And a few minutes later, I heard the door open up on the side of the ship, and here comes Senior Chief out, and he stands right there next to me. He goes, uh, Pendell Silly, how you doing? I said, shut up! <laughs> Not to him, to the rest of them. You know what that was? That was a man who, who was going to be part of what I was doing, and he put me out there, but he never left me alone. And when it came time to do something big, he trusted me. And when I walked up, I walked into Cheesemith. Don't ever, I'll never try, I'll never tell you to do this. I was E6. I walked in there. I told the chief in radio that this was going to happen one day. And I said, you're going to call me one day to come fix this thing. And you won't let me fix it now, but you're going to call me one day. And when you call me, I said, I'm going to come in here. I'm going to get in your face. I'm going to tell you that. And one day that thing broke. And he calls me up at 2 o'clock in the morning to fix this thing. And I run into Cheesemith, and I'm an E6. I'm not a chief. And all the chiefs are sitting there, my senior chief's sitting there, and I get right in Chief Horvath's faith, and I start chewing him out in Jesus' name and telling him he's everything but human. And C.G. Franklin says, oh, please shut up, shut up, shut up. They knew I was right and passionate about what I was doing. If you never get serious about what you're doing, you can never do anything for God. I walked out of the chief's mess. I should have been in captain's mass. Senior chief came up to the ET shop, and he said, Elliot, you're out of your stinking mind. He goes, we all know you're right. He goes, there's not a man in that room. You just can't walk in there and chew out a chief. Do you understand that? I said, but senior, I said, he goes, we know you love this stuff. Now let me ask you a question. Do we love Jesus that much? Would you give him 90 days? I tell everybody, if you come to church for six months, just give Jesus six months of your life, your life will change. Will you, I, I, we're going to, me and Beth are going to give him the 90 days. And if he calls me up in 90 days and he asks me, I'm going to give him a recorded, I'll fax him what, what is done. Beth will do the work, and I will, we will have the results. <laughs> we will have the results. In front of you, I'm making a commitment, what I'm asking you to do, and I'm not going to have an altar call. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to go home tonight and ask the Lord, say, Lord, help me do this. I think this thing is serious. I want to serve God more than what I'm doing right now. I want to be able to complete the mission. That's what I want to do. The Lord wants to give us a greater mission, but he's got to say you've got to complete the one first. Father, thank you for your blessings tonight. Lord, that is a great message. Sometimes we come to church, Lord, thinking that we want to hear all these other things, and Lord, that's, a lot of times that's not it. Joseph had to wait, and Lord, he waited for the right time, and you put him in the right place at the right time, and that day you rose, he rose from the, the bottom of the dungeons in the world's greatest kingdom, uh, to the second in place of Pharaoh, Lord, past everybody, all those that put him there, Lord, had to watch him uh, get lifted up in front of their eyes. And, Lord, uh, the fear that must have come across their eyes. <clears throat> but Joseph was thankful. And, Lord, because of what he did, you put more into his hand, and, and uh, he saved his family. And 400 years later, or, or multiple years later, Lord, they all went back into Egypt, out of Egypt into Israel. And, Lord, a nation was born because of a man that watched the finances of somebody else. 
Uh, Lord, help us uh, what great things we could do if we just got our finances in order. And Lord, put them in a place like the little lad with the, the few fishes and a few loaves. Uh, be in the right place at the right time with a little uh, how much you could do with that. Father, I do pray that you'd bless this church. Uh, thank you uh, for Brother Ralph coming, Lord, and preaching at us. Uh, Lord, this message is exactly what we need to hear, it, nothing more. Help us to make a commitment to you, Lord, uh, as we do to this world, and straighten out our finances. Lord, give us the wisdom that we need, the knowledge and the understanding we need to do that, Lord. Give us the faith and the trust in you, Lord, to know that you oh, do own the cattle of a thousand hills, and what we have is yours. Lord, there's a lot of young people in here. I just pray that you'd give them the, the, uh, the wisdom right now as they grow, Lord, to start saving back and doing something so they can do something for you in a great way. Lord, help us to, to support those you want us to support and, and just get in a place where we can do the work you'd have us to do. And Father, we'll praise you and honor you in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Amen, amen. amen.